Well, if you were watching the headlines um, that were swirling around as you came in, uh, you could see that there were a whole bunch of themes in the headlines that are evocative of the types of attitudes that Americans hold these days towards immigrants and non-English languages that include obvious tensions that can, concerning the integration of immigrants. Um, they reflect nativism, they reflect the perception that these immigrants are foreign because they speak non-English languages. Uh, there are both positive and negative views voiced about the uh, um, English acquisition of immigrants, uh, some of which are coercive. Immigrants must learn English if they're going to be American. And of course, just the pragmatic aspects. And there's also some of the headlines that talk about the merits of bilingualism, while others talk about, hey, those who speak a non-English language are exhibiting the fact that they're un-American. What I'm going to do today is draw some material from a book that I'm working on. And I'm going to talk about some historical trends in uh, non-English language immig immigration to the United States and some of the contemporaneous uh, concerns and attitudes that were voiced as the uh, United States has experienced these different streams of immigrants. I'm essentially going to show that these attitudes that are occurring <coughs> today um, have their historical uh, counterparts. Then I'm going to make it an abrupt shift, and I'm going to look at a very micro transition. I'm going to look at English acquisition among individual immigrants, among children, um, and to some extent among adults. And then in the third section of my talk, what I'm going to do is try and tie these two things together and show how the combination of these micro-attributes involved in English acquisition among immigrants and kids um, and his large historical trends in immigration have conspired to add yet another theme of attitudes towards immigrants today, and that is the invidious comparison of today's immigrants with previous immigrants. So here's a graph of the regional origin of immigrants admitted to the United States since 1820, which is the first year that data on legal immigrants uh, first started being gathering. I'm sure that for the most part this graph looks very familiar to you, so I'm not going to discuss it at very much length. Maybe one of the few things I'm going to point out, though, that is usually not discussed uh, is the rapid upswing in immigration in the late 1800s was actually an even more rapid upswing in the entry of non-English language immigrants, or at least immigrants from non-English language countries or regions in the world. Uh, the dark blue at the bottom are immigrants from English language countries, and you can see it's much more stable um, than the upswings and downswings in non-English language immigrants. So, let's start talking a little bit about attitudes towards non-English language immigrants in the United States. I'm, I'm going to end up starting at the very beginning, or, well, almost the very beginning. Uh, early immigration to the United States, uh, the early streams involving Royalists and Quakers, uh, were actually very distinct, um, but they all shared an allegiance to the English language, and the result was that English was put into place as the dominating language of the nation. But still, relatively quickly, after the early English language streams to the states, uh, non-English speakers entered the nation. Um, during this time, facility in non-English languages was largely viewed as pragmatic, uh, a, a skill that granted access to codes of law, uh, learned institutions, and written sources of learning. And it was in this type of pragmatic vein that Benjamin Rush, and a signer of the Declaration of Independence urged that German and French be taught in the America's English schools. Uh, federal, government, uh, federal documents were published in numerous non-English language, including the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And there were numerous non-English language schools, and in fact there were non-English language school boards uh, throughout the nation. So throughout the 1700s and well up into the 1800s, Overall, yes, I know there are nuances here, but I'm skipping over uh, centuries in a minute. Uh, non-English languages and non-English language speakers were largely tolerated. Benjamin Franklin, by the way, was largely appreciative of immigrants and the skills that they brought to the new nation. The irritation that is evident in this quotation um, is 
uh, which is often used, and uh, probably wrongly, to illustrate Frank Franklin's negative views of immigrants um, and non-English languages, was in fact a temporary reaction to his printing press just having failed because of intense competition from several printing presses run by German language immigrants. So, in fact, he was relatively tolerant. But in the late 1800s, with this rapid upswing in immigration, particularly the, the particularly rapid upswing in non-English language immigrants, uh, was what turned out to be a time of, or perhaps because of it, was a time of increasing nativism. And of course, those of you who are taking or teach courses know all about the beginning of the exclusionary and restriction. Uh, restrictive acts that are taking place at the time. Meanwhile, with this growth of nativism and many other phenomena happening, uh, there was some voicing of negative attitudes involving language at the time. The first quotation is from by Walker, who clearly argues that differences of race of speech are innate and thereby lead to uh, powerful obstacles uh, to the nation, to the uh, union of the nation. Um, F.D. Walker, by the way, was an important person, uh, at least to demographers. He was a leading statistician of the time and was the director of the Census Bureau, uh, or what we would call the Census Bureau, uh, during the 1880s and um, 1890s. And so he was responsible for some of the items about race and language that were incorporated into the census at the time. Um, meanwhile, of course, there was uh, a voice thing of negative attitudes, uh, linking non-English languages to foreigners and strangers. This alternate, this quotation, of course, is, is very famous. Meanwhile, uh, with the growth of uh, scientific racism, non-English languages were, in fact, being used by major statistical agencies at the time as indicators of race. And in fact, this mother tongue question, which was hurriedly attached to the 1910 census, was explicitly viewed as a measure of race. Uh, it was used because earlier national origins were used to mark racial origins, but that constant shifting of national boundaries that was so inconveniently happen happening in Europe at the time, and the lack of a direct correspondence between language and nation state made that national origins no longer sufficed. By the way, mother tongue, this mother tongue item, um, which was meant as a sign of race or an indicator of race, uh, meant that the US Bureau of the Census assigned the children of immigrant parents their parents' mother tongue. As a result, all of the historic tables dating from 1910, 1920, and 1930 are in fact wrong when they talk about the mother tongue of second generation Americans. Wrong in the sense that the children, many of them didn't speak that um, mother tongue at all. Of course, the attitudes towards immigrants, non-English language immigrants in particular, are multifaceted and, and quite complex. Uh, during the 1910s, 1900s and 1910s, a much more progressive stream of thought saw potential in the newcomers. And with time, effort, and motivation, these new immigrants could be molded into Americans. The Americanization movement, which was at its strongest during the 1910s, attempted to provide new Americans with the knowledge of American civic culture and American ideals in classes and local institutions such as the YMCA's, churches, and major industries. However, in practice, the first and most important aspect of the Americanization movement was teaching immigrants English. By the height of the Americanization movement, the English language had been imbued with special attributes and was viewed as the only language in which immigrants could learn and understand American ideals. And in fact, Keller implies that knowing the English language inoculates people against un-American ideals. So all we need to do is teach those terrorists English and all will be well. But the, uh, American, uh, the Americanization movement overreached during the hysteria surrounding World War I and became overtly coercive. Uh, immigrants were threatened with deportation if they didn't learn English. 
The use of non-English languages was forbidden in schools and in public places, including in Iowa on the telephone. And New York State required immigrants aged 16 to 21 to attend night school if they didn't speak English. Of course, the, the coercion and the ineffectiveness, or large ineffectiveness, largely ineffectiveness, of the English language classes that immigrants were forced to take punctured, helped to puncture the Americanization movement and led to a backlash. The Meyer versus Nebraska decision reaffirmed that non-English language Americans enjoyed the same rights as all other Americans. Um, and by the 1930s, immigrants and their protectors were writing editorials pointing out that knowing English, while possibly a very practical um, set of skills and very useful in the American context, was not a requirement to being a good American. So here we see in the 1930s the beginning of an uncoupling of uh, having to know English and being an American. Well, <laughs> By the time we get up to the 1960s and 70s, as you can see in the little inset, um, we're after a period of several, or several decades with very, very low levels of immigration. And during this time, issues and attitudes about non-English language essentially disappeared. Uh, the two legislative acts that I've put up there were important and involved language. The first one, the Voting Rights Act granted or the publication of voting materials in this small set of languages in certain areas of the country. And of course, the Lau versus Nichols case um, was the start of a push to in introduce non-English languages to non-English language students in schools. But basically, it was a time of disappearance of language issues uh, from public view and, as it turns out, from many of the social sciences. I happen to know this personally because I come from a non-English language country and when I walked in in the late 70s and told my advisor that I was going to do a dissertation on languages in the United States, he looked at me and he said with all seriousness, but everyone speaks English. <laughs> so um, this sort of rapid a uh, five-minute jaunt through several centuries of attitudes about the sorts of um, concerns that were voiced about immigrants and non-English languages obviously has uh, parallels with history and I said that kind of backwards, I'm sorry. I meant to say that there are parallel parallels between the headlines that you see today about immigrants and non-English language immigrants and those that have been voiced over the last century and a half. And they're actually relatively complex, include a wide variety. So now, um, you sit and think about non-English languages in the United States and immigrants today uh, with the recent upswing in immigration uh, there's a large number of research questions and public issues that can be addressed, including these are some that, in fact, I'm covering in this book. But today, I'm going to focus just on one, because it's a very important question for, much, for many social institutions in the United States, and as I will show, hopefully in a couple of minutes, links back, links back to attitudes and demography. So, how quickly do immigrants learn English? There's two bodies of literature on this particular question. Uh, the first is by social scientists, and they basically use survey cross-sectional data to show that English language proficiency among adult immigrants is strongly associated with a large number of characteristics, such as national linguistic origins, marital status, residence in areas dominated by speakers of the same language, and, in particular, by education and length of res residence. Uh, education, of course, is an important predictor of how well immigrants speak language for a wide number of reasons. Uh, cognitive skills, immigrants sometimes actually learn English directly uh, in school. There's e um, extra economic motivations for more highly educated immigrants to learn English, because if they don't, they lose more income. Um, and if, what else? 
of course, it's also true that knowing English can allow you to get more education. So it's a very complex set of relationships. Uh, the strong relationship that the social scientists have shown over and over again between length and residence and how well immigrants speak English, hmm, the reasons for that are more of a black box. The idea is kind of, oh, gee, you take these immigrants, you put them in an English language nation, and hmm, five or ten years later, they know more English. Why? Because of exposure to opportunities to learn, to hear, to learn, and to practice English, but the mechanics are not uh, very well elucidated. Linguists, on the other hand, um, look at things differently, and uh, they have emphasized the age at which learning English begins, or age at onset of second language acquisition, often measured through age at immigration for immigrants. And now, of course, I'm going to start talking a little bit about the critical period hypothesis or maturational constraints. Now, these critical period maturational constraint hypotheses focus on ultimate attainment among adults, and they're very detailed observational studies in which uh, they, linguists often focus on s particular aspects of L2 proficiency, such as syntax, lexicon, or phonology. But almost all of these show a negative relationship between age at immigration and ultimate attainment. Now, we're talking about adults. I, I'm showing this because it, I think it's cool. Uh, <coughs> this is a classic study. It's cool because it's an excellent study, and it was done here by Johnson and Newport in 19, and published in 1989. It's based on some Chinese and Korean adult immigrants, both students and faculty here at the university. Uh, and essentially what it shows is that there's a strong negative relationship between scores on a grammar test, a very long grammar test, by the way, 280 items, and uh, aged immigration. Now, this, this is a classic study. It's uh, well regarded, and so it's been heavily scrutinized um, so, uh, for all sorts of things, such as the details of the sample and the items and that sort of stuff. And there's, but there is a sort of an argument about to whether or not this actually shows a critical age. And if so, when? Is it 8? Is it 10? Is it 20? Where do you pick? It's kind of hard. But the general conclusion, the negative relationship is a very stable one, so we can t deal with that. Yes. From a sociological point of view, though, since I'm not a linguist, this negative relationship between age and immigration and syntax um, has counterparts in other dimensions of language proficiency. There is a strong neg negative relationship between age at onset of second language learning and accent or phonology. And this is something that even linguistically naive listeners like us can hear. So it doesn't count for Susan because she's, I know she's a linguist. Please call Stella. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. Six spoons of fresh snow peas. <coughs> five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. Somebody who immigrated late? Please call Stella. Ask her to bring these things <coughs> with her from the store. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of uh, blue cheese, and... And in Bengali? Please call Stella. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. Please call Stella. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. Six spoons of fresh peas. Okay. Now, all of these examples are from foreign-born Americans who learned English naturalistically rather than in school, and who have, each of them has been in the United States for more than 15 years. So presumably they reached their ultimate attainment. But notice how, I saw the smiles around, notice how easy it is to hear this. You can actually hear uh, the relationship. Now, here we have adults, immigrant adults, we can hear how well it is or less well they speak English. 
If we have a critical period or mass generational constraints that results in the strong relationship uh, in adulthood, something has to be happening before these people get to adulthood. So how does the critical period manifest itself in childhood? Uh, <coughs> previous studies have focused on uh, limited English proficient children or a limited number of age or grade cohorts. Um, it is true that all of these studies show that increases in English proficiency occur over time or over length of residence in the United States. But because of the very large difficulties in gathering appropriate data across age and entry cohorts, none of them or very few of them do good comparisons. And as it turns out, if you have a, a number of 11-year-olds, <coughs> you measure their English proficiency, the ones who came in early in life versus the ones that came in at, say, age 10, the ones who came early in life, well, of course they speak better, better English. They've been in the United States longer. So the problem here is actually a statistical problem of trying to disentangle time in the United States from age at entry. So this is what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to use census data, which has as an advantage a large number of cases, so I can pull out trends. I'm going to uh, construct synthetic age at immigration cohorts, and I'm going to do curve fitting. So here's what the data look like. Basically, I have a sample of foreign-born children in Spanish language households. <coughs> About half of them speak English very well, or only English. They've been in the States for about six years. Uh, on average, they entered in middle childhood, with significant proportions entering very early in childhood, uh, entering in middle uh, childhood, and then in adolescence, which is very nice for statistical reasons, because I can separate this out. So here is the results of my modeling. The very first curve, the left one, the left one the bl it's blue, it starts out dotted because it's uh, unobserved or in the census, suggests that children who enter at about age one as infants into the United States quickly learn English or increase their level of English and then continue to learn more and more English until by the time we get them up to age 18, um, they're pretty close to perfect. All right. Now, just after age five, you can see there's an orange cohort. This cohort <laughs> entered at age five and a half. Yet also, as these children age in the American context, they also learn English quite quickly in the first couple of years. And they also continue to learn English albeit at slightly slowing rates as they become older. In fact, I have constructed this graph so that the curve for the age at onset of age five is exactly the same as the age at onset for age one. In other words, the only thing that is driving the predicted level of English proficiency among these kids has to do with how long they've been in the States. This is the same curve over and over again. And this curve reproduces all the results that have been found in previous literature. If you look at the rectangle of people, or of kids who are age 15, you can see that the ones that entered at earlier ages, the early in childhood, are better English speakers than the ones who just entered a year or two ago. So and this is the result that we have seen in previous literature. The longer children have been in the States, the better they speak English. So did you just say that those lines would converge at the... Eventually, level? yeah, if, if I were to They're continue... They're parallel lines, they would converge. Yes. Okay. No, ultimately, they would converge at four, presumably, assuming that uh, language learning continues forever, which okay. is a reasonable assumption. Okay, this is what the real data look like. Uh, this is what the census data actually show. And you can see, or maybe you can see, I hope you can see, that the curves are falling down. Essentially, rates of language acquisition, English language acquisition among kids, are, get slower and slower the later and later the kids enter the country. Uh, it's hard to disentangle all those colors. So here is a graph 
that shows the rates for each of those curves. And essentially this graph shows that for the age of immigration cohorts between 0 and 5, um, actually there's almost, almost linear between, that surprised me, the 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, very high rates of English language learning, but for as we get down into childhood, later childhood, the rates subside quite dramatically. For those of you who are into coefficients, <laughs> this is a very no, formal no way. <laughs> yeah, this is a very formal way of presenting that. Uh, the one, one of the few things that this table shows that I couldn't show before in the diagrams is that all of this is statistically significant, and none of this is affected by uh, differential financial or economic resources in the household. All right. So what have I shown here? Age at onset matters during childhood. Children become proficient the longer they've been in the States. And, well, we kind of actually knew that before, but trajectories differ across age and immigration cohort. There's a clear downward progression in rate of progress. And in fact, um, I'm in the process right now of showing that this declining rate uh, in second language acquisition continues into adult, well into adulthood. So the older you are, um, the slower you learn a second language. This is a terrible conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this particular um, little set of studies has implications <laughs> for a number of things. I'm going to run through the first three because I think they're particularly interesting. After all, I did start out this section focused on the question of how long it takes immigrants and their children to learn English. And this is particularly important for education, for schools, in light of various initiatives such as Proposition 227, which seeks to impose time limits on the special services available to non-English kids. Um, but there are, in fact, some estimates of how long it takes immigrant kids to learn English. Three to five years to become proficient in oral English or in conversational English, and five to seven years to become proficient in academic English. Hmm. Why didn't I start out with those, <laughs> rather than going through all that? <laughs> well, these estimates are by Kenji Hakata and his associates. And they're based on retrospective data and test scores for U.S. kids in California, uh, two California school districts that are generally acknowledged as being particularly successful in teaching their LEP kids. In addition, when you read the study carefully, the estimates refer to children who are in the school district by kindergarten and follow through until grade seven. So the results do not take into account the fact that the rates of English language acquisition are slower among children entering later. So these are very conservative estimates of how long it takes children, immigrant children to learn English. For those of you who read the New York Times yesterday, these estimates were repeated uh, in, the, in the major article on immigrant children and language in the United States. Um, and the body of the article was about the difficulties that these high school children are facing. Uh, in, and some of them were recent immigrants, but some were not. Uh, anyway, the, the article was about the difficulties faced by these children uh, trying to keep up with their age and grade peers in an English-dominated school. So Hakata's um, estimates are much, not much to. They, they pertain only to part of, only to some immigrant children. <coughs> okay, there's implications for the family of this differential rate of, or trajectory of English acquisition among immigrants. After all, when immigrant families come to the United States, uh, most of them are different ages. The parents are older when they come, and the children are younger. I actually started looking for this phenomena after I went to a graduation for one of our graduate students. And so I always have really pleasant time when the parent, you talk to the parents and you tell them how proud they should be of their son or daughter and 
um, how lovely it is that they got their PhD and everyone's happy. It's just so nice. So I said something nice about the student. I'll call her Nina and how, well, just essentially how wonderful <laughs> she was and how proud they should be of her. And the parents looked at me um, without any comprehension. And so we all looked to Nina to translate. And she couldn't. And she came out with three or four words uh, in her parents' native language. And I was saying, oh, this is interesting. Hmm. I talked to Nina a couple weeks later. Okay, well, how did this happen? And she had a very complex family story in which her parents came to the States, the kids were uh, left back in the native country for a while, then they came and lived with other relatives and their parents went back to the native country. And so there was also, and then plus she had, she was the youngest and her older brother and sisters were bilingual and they acted as linguistic brokers. And so she only really spent about a year and a half living with her parents alone um, in late high school. But by then she could only speak English and her parents never learned never learned English, and this is how it's happening. If you look at census data, uh, depending on how you define this, it looks be like at least between 6 and 8 percent of immigrant kids end up living in this type of situation. Well, you can also see it among siblings, because siblings are different ages when they come into the States. And here I'm looking at households. Uh, Let's focus on, four, on households where there's four kids. Uh, these are Spanish language households where the parents are speaking Spanish. And you can see that there's a significant, nah, excuse me, a significant number where all children speak only English. Uh, there's also a significant number, about 13 uh, percent, where the, some children speak Spanish, some speak English, some speak um, only English, some speak only Spanish. There's variation in the linguistic repertoires. And this variation follows age and entry quite closely, with the older children being the ones that are much more likely to know Spanish and the younger ones being much more likely to know uh, only English. Okay, now, societal reactions to immigrants. All right. Um, now I'm going back to the beginning of the talk. Because of the large upswing in immigration in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, and in spite of the intervening of the civil rights era, there has been a reemergence of strong links between poor English skills and immigrant status, uh, the use of non-English language, languages and foreignness, um, and also some racialization attending the use of a non-English language. There has also been a reemergence of a push for immigrants to learn English more quickly. Uh, there's a very defiant statement of this uh, from the U.S. Commission on Immigration Reform headed by Barbara Jordan in the early 90s. And of course, there are our English-only initiatives. Along with this reemergence of all these attitudes towards immigrants and the learning of English, there has been, I think, something a little bit new. There's been this invidious comparison uh, between the old immigrants, the European immigrants and the Asian and the Spanish language immigrants. And the argument is, well, of course, they're imposing their language, the contemporary immigrants are imposing their language on us. They're making us provide voting materials in Spanish or whatever. And they're not learning English as quickly as the old immigrants. Now I'm thinking, why is it that we would, that people would think that the European immigrants did not learn English, or excuse me, learn English more quickly than immigrants today learn English. Well, let's look back at demography. <laughs> so I'm a demographer. Uh, the inset is, the small inset is from the graphs that I showed you before, and it shows the volume of immigration into the United States during, uh, from 1900 on, 1910 on. And the larger graph, so that's a flow chart, a <laughs> slope. It's, it's uh, showing new immigrants coming into the country. All right, well, uh, the larger graph <coughs> shows the stock of immigrants. This shows immigrants living in the country 
from 1910 up through uh, 2000. And after all, if, let's look at 1930 for the moment. Uh, in the small inset, we all know that in the 1930s, there's almost no immigration to the United States, okay? It's zero. Well, in 1930, it didn't just happen that all the immigrants in the United States died or left. I mean, they stayed here, the ones that were already here. And what did they do? Demographically speaking, they either died, and in fact some did, or they aged in place, which is a demographic term that basically says this population got older on average while they stayed in the country. All right, and, yet, and because of mortality <coughs> and immigration, um, ultimately the resident foreign-born population uh, decreased in size uh, well into the early 1970s. Okay. <coughs> So here we are, uh, just after 2000. Um, let's think about the resident foreign-born population in the United States in the 1970s and the 1980s. Who were they? Well, they were older because they'd aged in place. They had longer residence in the United States. And they're, by the way, much older. Um, the median and average ages of Immigrants to the United States in the 60s, 70s, and 80s of European immigrants is well over 50, while the median age of the his, um, Asian and Spanish uh, immigrants is, um, depending on how you measure it, in the late 20s or early 30s. So there's a generation, literally, a huge amount of time that's different. Um, longer, the European immigrants who were uh, in the United States in the 70s and 80s, also had immigrated at much earlier ages. Let's just think back. If, you're, if you immigrated, <coughs> if you're, I don't know, um, if you immigrated at age 20, uh, excuse me, in 1920, how old would you be in 1980? You'd be 60. That's if you immigrated as a baby. If you immigrated in 1920 as an as an adult, let's say 30, how old would you be in 1980? You would be 90 and likely to be dead, unfortunately. I, I, tomography is a dismal science, okay? <laughs> so if we're looking at immigrants in 1980 who last immigrated in the large, big wave of immigration, they immigrated as young children. Ah, well, gee, young children are very likely to learn English very easily and very well. So the resident foreign-born population in the 1970s and 80s, um, many of whom were the grandparents of contemporary adults in the United States, are, have been selected to be excellent English language speakers. And so, here you are in the United States, and around the turn of the 21st century, you look at these new immigrants who are young adults who have been in the United States a very small number of years. In fact, 40, at least 40% of immigrants in the United, recent immigrants in the United States today have been in the States for uh, less than 10 years. So they're, they haven't been in the United States for very long, and they immigrated at ages where uh, the rapidity or the rate with which you learn English is slower. And so I am now arguing that the contemporary responses to language issues among immigrants in the United States is partly attributable to the confluence of these micro and these macro trends. Uh, the macro trends, of course, is the historical trends in immigration during the 20th century with that huge fall off in the middle of the century and then the recent upswing, which meant that immigrants aged in place and now set up the stage for an implicit uh, comparison of the early versus late arriving immigrants and a combination of these individual level type uh, the excuse me, trajectories in English language acquisition in which age at migration and length of residence are so important in predicting the English language proficiency of immigrants. And that's it. <laughs>
And who answered? Oh, I can answer the first one very easily. The question is, how well does this person speak English? Uh, very well, well, not well, not at all. Who answers it? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, presumably, it's the person who's the household respondent, which is likely to be a parent. And for children, at least, uh, it's probably the parent answering on behalf of the child. Ah, well, ah, uh, oh, there's a problem. <laughs> the, it's somewhat mitigated, though, by the fact that in 1980, 90, and 2000, the questionnaires were available in non-English languages. So, especially, of course, particularly in Spanish. So, they're answering a question that's in Spanish about how well they speak English. But how would they assess that if they speak English? Ah, well, it, it, it's a self-reported um, global measure. And you can argue, as I have to say that she's a linguist. <laughs> and so, <coughs> this is the problem of... this conversation <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it, it's an important issue. Uh, it's, look, yeah, this, this question drives linguists crazy because, of course, it's not observational and it's not via a test. I can only say in its defense, number one, it's relatively reliable. It's pr um, it it, it um, acts like a duck, it walks like a duck. It, in the sense of when you start looking at the answers to this question in relation to all sorts of other phenomena, the answers respond are uh, end up uh, working in ways that you would expect, such as more educated people are more likely to say that they speak English very well, and etc. So, I see Susan's not convinced by that. I will say second reason um, that the answers to this question have some validity is that instead of the somewhat artificial laboratory conditions in which linguists set their respondents down and then measure whether or not they've um, raised or lowered a vowel, uh, that respondents actually have a good idea of how good their English skills are in their daily lives. And if they go to the store and they can't order or they can't find a can of tomatoes because they can't deal with stuff, well, they're, they actually have an understanding so they know that they're not doing well in school or in the grocery store or something I like that. I would use that kind of test. That's a big flaw in the Newport and Johnson study because it's a grammar test. Yes? There is a number of uh, well, uh, journal articles kind of testing the reliability census items. I think one, but the census bureau hasn't done reliability testing. So I'd be amazed if they hadn't also. They have done reliability. Really. They've, they've had uh, test and retest measures of the reliability and uh, the, for some populations the, the question is much more reliable than for others. It's much more reliable for immigrant populations. It's not reliable for um, people who learned French in school and then turn around and self-assess their English proficiency. And by the way, which happens, I mean, Americans over-report on the census. Uh, Native-born Americans appear to over-report that they speak another language because they learned it in high school or something like that. And as soon as they start doing that, they get thrown into the population of people who, or the sample of people who answer the question on proficiency. But the proficiency measure, that would affect the proficiency measure. That is, how well do you speak English? It would. <laughs> well, well, one so, I mean, not the, I mean, the, affect the population who's asked that question, not the necessarily the distribution of the response. I mean, it doesn't mean the people who learn French in high school are asked how well they speak English as adults. Actually, they are. They give a more or less accurate answer on that, you know, how well they speak English? One would think. Yeah, right. But, but, they, but they don't. What? <laughs> and what the, the I'm sorry? I mean, they, how does that affect the, profici the proficiency rate? Well, it doesn't affect it at all, or, or not very uh, much, but for immigrants. Um, well, when you look at native-born Americans, there are some s slightly bizarre things going on in the proficiency data. Can I ask a question from, like, a non-linguist question? <laughs> Can't you just go to King's School or something and just test it another way without 
extensive? I mean, could I know you did that for you know, a broader sample, but don't we know a lot of this stuff already? Can't we just go to a high school and just interview some students? And I mean, I, I I'm just a normal person, and I I believe your data. I, <laughs> <laughs> Thank it's you. Hard for me to learn languages. The older I get, mm -hmm. it's even worse. So I figure you're right. You could use other data that nobody would jump on. Mm -hmm. right? Well, there's actually a lot of problems with, with the data, with, with trying to gather the data. Let's say we go to a high school, mm -hmm. all right? And, um, well, to begin with, a lot of very recent immigrants, 14 to 17 year olds, are not in that high school. They never get into it, particularly the illegal ones. And so you are, you're starting out with a sample of kids that have already <coughs> been selected. High Yes, mm -hmm. to have at least some facility of English. So mm -hmm. that's, um, a, a that's number one problem. Second, um, if you go into a high school and you want to look at age at onset, mm -hmm. you want to say that five-year-olds learn it much faster than ten-year-olds do, you then have to look at your high school kids and start divvying them up into age at onset cohorts. And you run out of cases really, really fast, which means you have to have a multi-high school uh, study and now we're running into expense and then there's um, the way you can start it the other way around um, and start picking up immigrant kids as they come into the school and now we run into the problem of measuring English language proficiency in childhood uh, language proficiency is a moving target we all expect five-year-olds to speak differently than ten-year-olds um, even if they only know one language let alone two and so there's that difficulty as well and so while I agree with you that at least some of this is immediately apparent, after all those sound clips, yeah, um, I mean, you, could he you could hear it. Yeah. But um, <coughs> sometimes research has to try and pin down stuff that we think we know, mm -hmm. as well as uh, stuff that we don't. And There's somebody along the back wall who's been mm -hmm. trying to get in here. Yes. Um, why, do you know why the recent immigrants are likely to come after early childhood? Is it just because babies don't travel on their own, or does it have something to do with <laughs> U.S. immigration policy? Um, or is it just, you know, in 60 years, those that came in early childhood will be more prevalent? Or? Oh, yes, there's the, this selection. Um, <laughs> mortality selection uh, goes on all the time. And so today's immigrants in 60 years, uh, if we look at immigrants who came in 2000 and we look at them in 60 years, it, that particular group will consist of the people who came in at younger ages. Um, now back to your original question, uh, what ages do immigrants actually enter the country? Well, it's usually thought that it's economic motivations that pull immigrants from other countries into the United States. And uh, economic motivations pulls young adults, <coughs> uh, late adolescents, and in the 20s up to 30. Some of them bring kids with them, some do not. As it turns out, immigration is also selective of, uh, s to some extent, single people and married couples who are not burdened by kids that they have to drag away from their local native schools or whatever. So as it turns out, about one in five immigrants comes as a child, meaning less than age 18. And they're almost all, almost, but not quite all of them are coming with their parents. Hi. Hi. Um, my first question has to do with this last point about uh, the more recent immigrants. I also noticed on your work that they're less educated. That struck me. That was kind of confusing to me. I have two more questions that I can ask. Why less educated? Well, um, I I, I'm paint. I'm wondering if, but if we, certainly if we go back to previous centuries, especially in the 19th century, early 20th, before the 30s, I would expect that. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to punt a little bit on the educational level of immigrants around the turn of the century, or be between, say, 1900 and 1930s. I think to some extent the educational levels of immigrants at that time were more equivalent to the educational levels of Americans at the time. Right now, the educational levels of immigrants entering the country are bimodal in the sense of there's some very highly educated immigrants and some very poorly educated immigrants. And <coughs> most of the 
not all, but most of the concern about immigrants not learning English or imposing their foreign language on us uh, focuses on the, on the less educated immigrants. Okay, yeah. so it's not a generalization about all, it's about the ones that show up in the census as not very proficient. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, brief question about how this speaks to the um, loss of the native language. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to Spanish, one thing that people have emphasized is that it's not so much that Spanish speakers are not, Mexican uh, people are not losing their Spanish, they are losing it at the same pace as everyone else. It's just the new immigration that keeps the language so vivid in the US. I'd like your comment on that. <laughs> Um, that's an excellent question. It truly is. And there is some, <coughs> it's a big question as to whether or not the Spanish speakers in the United States are, let me back up a bit. Number one, um, the same sort of patterns that I presented here with the rapidity of second language acquisition by age. Uh, the older you are, the less likely, the, the less rapid you are to acquire English. Well, we can exactly turn that relationship around for minority language loss. It turns out that um, the younger you are, the, the quicker it is you are to lose the facility in a native language. And so minority language maintenance or, um, it varies inversely with age at onset. So there's that. Okay, now, the Spanish versus the others. Um, it does kind of look like, at the aggregate level, that language loss is uh, less rapid among Spanish speakers than among other non-English language populations. And my hypothesis, I have two hypotheses for this. One is the constant influx of new speakers who are not yet um, bilingual, which um, helps maintain the language among the people already here. And the second thing has to do with uh, the establishment of these areas, geographic areas, that are now becoming Spanish language communities. Um, so, and of course, I talk a little bit about some of that in Chicago. Interestingly enough, in Chicago, uh, some of the uh, ethnic areas that we know about, such as Chinatown, uh, now has more Spanish speakers in it than it does Chinese speakers. Mm -hmm. And so there's quite a lot of segregation and concentration of Spanish speakers in a variety of places across the nation, which of course support the use of Spanish. So there's that. So there's two hypotheses. And Concerns, there's a, a census coming out in 2010. Yes. To what extent do you think the questions about language are, there's an effort to improve on them, to improve the kind of data we get out of the census? <coughs> oh. Is any of your research going into that? I am sorry to tell you <laughs> and myself that the 2010 cens uh, census will not have any questions on language. <laughs> Zero. Well, yes, I know. Does the survey? Yes, it does. The American Community Survey does, but there are problems with that, particularly with respect to the smaller language populations. Was it a conscious decision to take them off? They were on. Well, the, the decision flowed out of the, the, the lack of language items uh, flowed out of the decision not to have a long form of the census in 2010. And so all the long form yeah. items are gone and the, the American Community Survey is supposedly taking over on them. But the American Community Survey has a lot of problems associated with it. To begin with, it has a 30% non-response rate. So I think there are, and when you think about non-response, and it is, at least in the census, there is an effort to try and send out enumerators to try and get the 30%, the original 30% non-response rate to the census. Um, so by the way, you'll save the government money if you fill out your forms in 2010, because you won't have an enumerator coming to your household. But in the ACS, which is a rolling survey of about 50,000 households every month, um, there's this huge non-response rate and there's nothing, there's, there's no enumerator. There's a follow-up questionnaire and that's it. So if you don't answer the first one, you get a second one and then you're, you're a non-response. Now who is it that doesn't respond to the census? <laughs> uh, it, the people who have difficulty with language, who do, who... And it would be in English and, and it's only in English. Because right. they don't know they don't speak English. That's right. Unlike the 2000 census, which is available relatively easily in a number of different languages. The ACS is, uh, they're working on making it available in Spanish, and it's definitely available in Spanish in Puerto Rico. But there's still lots of problems. Uh, it's, I think, still only available easily in English. 
and in selected areas, it's being tested in Spanish. You have a huge Asian immigrant population. You showed on that graph. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And what, what languages would it need to be? Well, in the ACS, I, I don't believe that it's yet available. The ACS is not yet available in the Asian languages. The 2010 census will be, mm -hmm. by the way, but uh, not. But as I said, it's the short form. It only has about six questions on it. So, and none of them are language questions. So yes, I think this is a real problem. Um, as a de demographer and researcher, I'm devastated by this decision on the part of the Census Bureau. Usually, there's a group of people that have to leave at one, and usually there's a bunch of questions left. So if, if Jillian is willing, uh, for those that can stay, maybe we can ask. <laughs> so, how about a couple of more questions? There's one over here. Does your data incorporate the, cons uh, the possibility that a, a new immigrant has studied English in his native country before the immigrant? The data? Uh, don't allow me to speak to that question, but I would think that with the spread of English around the world. Mm -hmm. In some sense, one could argue, if you extrapolate widely, wildly, that this problem is going to take care of itself because English is becoming a second language among numerous the European nations, obviously, also um, many of the Asian countries as well. And Latin America has, be, has been slower than the other countries to incorporate English, but it's, it's also happening there. So yeah, maybe this is kind of a temporary phenomena, and in the 22nd century, uh, this, it'll no longer be an issue. These have all been very crisp, by my standards, these very crisp kind of questions that allowed for pretty precise kind of answers, and this is a very sloppy one, but um, there are more uh, sociologists of immigration, um, you know, doing more or less systematic sort of comparisons of the sort that you started with. And I'm wondering with regard to um, the kind of um, level of foreign language um, interaction kind of in immigrant communities, um, whether that really is any higher, and the sort of thing I mean is, uh, you know, uh, foreign language newspapers would be an example, but maybe <coughs> also, maybe also language in, in, a, in, in uh, instruction in a language other than English. Um, I don't know, I'll, I don't know what else we could look at to sort of measure this, but <coughs> the vague impression that I have is that there was actually much more of that in the early 20th century than there is today, and I, I don't know exactly how to measure that systematically, but um, but it does seem to relate to your beginning concern, which was that um, there's an assumption made with regard to these European immigrants that is, is wrong in terms of your data, but I'm wondering if it might very well be wrong in this other regard as well, that there was much more foreign language stuff around in the early Newspapers, you know, what about foreign language media? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the radio, it wasn't there. Right. Well, if you take, so I'll, I'll just take 10 more seconds, but it's, it's an example that people usually don't think of. If you take the early 20th century, this will stop after a certain point, you're probably around World War I period. But if you take the early 20th century and you take parochial, rather than public mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. Also churches. Uh, all, the, all the instruction was in foreign languages, or almost all of it. You know. So kids are actually learning in Polish, Italian, Czech, and so on. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, there's, I can picture situations where that might be true today, but I mean, generally, nobody's going to put up with that. They're just going to throw the kids in there. And, yeah. you know. So anyway, I don't know with whether, um, you know, whether there are uh, not, not, not so much real careful people like you, but maybe kind of looser sociologists that are doing. Uh, <laughs> looser sociologists. Yeah, yeah. I don't <laughs> hang out. <laughs> I don't hang out with looser sociologists. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, what do you think about that? I guess I would think that you're probably correct that back in the 1890s, shall we say, around 1900s that it was probably easier to live out your life in a non-English language uh, 
in a community, go to school, go to church, uh, and shop. Sh shop with your neighbors or hang out with your neighbors in whether, Polish, for example, or Italian, mm -hmm. than it is today, except for maybe Spanish. Right. Yeah, but I, I but even for Spanish, um, these concentrations that you see in Chicago, which you can clearly see on the map, and they're growing because of the continued immigration, they're heavily foreign-born. But I think it was more uh, likely that native-born Americans were likely to live in German language areas and Polish language areas back then. So I'd be particularly interested to see the differential persistent, possible differential persistence of the language into the second generation mm -hmm. and whether or not they could leave, live their, uh, their lives. Mm -hmm. I think it may well have been the case until, of course, World War I and the restrictive, all that nativism that stamped out the school boards and that sort of stuff. Because it, it's not a very systematic way of doing that, but if you picture an immigrant from what we know about, uh, at least some, some ethnic neighborhoods in the early 20th century, you can picture an immigrant more or less doing exactly what you just said. In other words, uh, the person certainly would be able to, to um, go to church. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if you're talking about Catholic immigrants, the immigrant would be able to receive the sacraments in, in their own language. They would have access to, uh, in, in many cases, in the case of Poles, multiple languages, so that if you were a Polish communist, you could read one paper, and if you were a Polish capitalist, you could read another one. And then, eventually, when you start getting radio, easy access to radio. And the distinction that you made between Spanish speakers today and other immigrants, I think, is very important, because I can picture situations, e even then, I would think it would be a little bit harder for, um, for Spanish-speaking immigrants to carry that off over a long period of time. But I can picture situations in which, like uh, the neighborhoods that you probably have in mind, where adult foreign language, uh, adult Spanish language uh, uh, speakers might be able to <coughs> almost get by that way, depending on who they worked for and so forth. But in the early 20th century, um, I, I, I think that I think there were places where you could just about do that. It doesn't mean that there was no pressure on immigrants, but I think it was probably a bit different, and you could function, uh, in, in, at least at that sort of basic level, the examples that we're kind of giving, you could function at that level probably without very much English. Uh, and if you control for the moment for Spanish speakers today and you look at other immigrants, I, I think that's pretty complicated. You know, I think that would be much harder for, for, uh, for a lot of other immigrant groups. Anyway. I follow up with comments? Um, I've been working with communities of immigrants I noticed that some people, they have such an infrastructure that they don't basically learn English. Or, or even I was in Japan working with uh, Latinos living there and they can really survive without knowing Japanese. Mm -hmm. So my question here is, and I'm interested on health and well-being of immigrants. Mm -hmm. but my question here is that how much of the of knowing the, language, the local language is important for uh, the overall well-being of immigrants? Mm. My gosh. Well, there's um, an NIH challenge grant out that asks for research on just this question. So there you go. There you go. There's a grant for you. Yeah. Uh, I think it would be very difficult for immigrants at, at all levels, if they did not speak English well, to have um, perfect access and perfect utilization of health care. Because if you come in and you don't speak English, you don't hear about the resources, community or other, or federal or state. And once you, if you hear about them somehow, then you have to actually interact with individuals who may not speak the language in order to get the resources. There's numerous stories of people showing up at emergency um, departments and clinics not being able to explain their problem correctly and end up ending up having to rely on linguistic brokers which are, who are often the 10 year old kid who doesn't understand what's going on. And if people are arriving at emergency departments with some crisis, chances are it's because they didn't have the appropriate preventative care which involves a lot of negotiation for people. Uh, so I, I, I can't explain what's wrong with me. 
in English, let alone, you know, if you picture somebody trying to explain some sort of complicated kind of health issue, but that's pretty hard, mm -hmm. I think. Of course, if you compare it to other countries, because you mentioned your research with Latinos in Japan, we really have to bring in the status of English as a global language. So mm -hmm. I had a medical uh, emergency in Thailand. I was able to go to a dentist, and the dentist herself, of course, you know, was perfectly fluent in English and able to help me. Had it been the inverse here, you know, had I been a Thai speaker in this country, um, or, you know, had I come to this country, it, it wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. So the fact that, you know, the, the, the medical professional that you're speaking to, that they happen to speak English in this country, is just kind of a, a historical accident, to put it that way. So I think the question of how much, is, how much, how many, how much language skills is, is vital to survive in a country depends very much on the historical moment of the country you're in it, it, mm -hmm. and, and the setup of that country. I mean, this country is so much imbibed with English that you can't get by without it. But other languages like the European Union at this moment, you wouldn't have a problem talking to any doctor in any of the countries in English and mm -hmm. being served. That's, mm -hmm. I think, something that needs to be. Mm -hmm. that, that's, yeah, that creates an asymmetry that is not in our power. Yes, things are change. changing, though. Uh -huh. It is true. I went to, I was at Carl a couple of weeks ago, and you could, there's a little sign by the receptionist that said, if you speak the, any one of these languages, you can dial this and, and dial and get a translator. So, but still, it's not the same as being able to speak to your healthcare provider in the, the language of your choice rather than their choice. Well, I wonder if the availability of, uh, the increased availability of media, the internet, DVDs, and such from the home country of immigrants has uh, an effect here as well. That is, if you can get on the internet and watch a movie or television, in Spanish, hmm. Um, or you can uh, get a DVD from the local grocery store that's Spanish language, or watch Telemundo, or what have you, in that sense, if that retards the need to speak English. Or retards the loss of the uh, native, native language. language well, yeah. right. Or acts as an incentive for young people. To There's that too. And mm -hmm. I think that this are almost completely open questions as to how it is that the new media are affecting okay. this process. But it's also true that I think I would hypothesize that this is only for middle class and middle class people because the people working out on the strawberry fields do not, you know, obsess over the internet when they're looking at their email or whatever. Yeah, but they call home every weekend. That's true. Maybe they're using Skype. You're right. Oh, no, the phone cards. cards, yeah. Phone cards. <laughs> So I don't know exactly where I'm going with this. It just seems kind of like a gap of something that we haven't talked about. But what about change in the intent at migration from now and previous waves where um, I would assume previously it's been more permanent migration and now we have a much more circular migration system of people entering and leaving the country. And it seems to me that that would affect their um, language acquisition because obviously if they're not planning on staying for very long, they're going to be much less concerned with uh, learning English and becoming more proficient. And um, also, um, I wanted to comment earlier, when we were talking about <coughs> age, um, coming in at, a, at an older age right now, um, we see many late teens and early 20s at time working age, um, Hispanic immigrants specifically, and it's like the immigrant population, instead of being fueled by the younger immigrants getting older, it's being fueled more by um, circular migration of people of the same age. See so what I'm saying? So yes. the, I guess the age composition of the immigrant uh, population now is more kind of <coughs> around this working age instead of going through the full life cycle, people immigrating at a young age and staying. Okay. So that could be affecting the, the question um, that was made earlier about losing Spanish. Are, are they not losing Spanish? Well, I think the children are probably losing Spanish at the same rate, but there are less children aging through the life cycle here than people circling in. Okay. Well, I have a couple sense. comments. Yes, yes. <laughs> the, the immigration issue, of course, we don't have good data on immigration, um, at least certainly not comprehensive data. And I, I couldn't tell you whether or not the immigration from, or the, the immigrants leaving back in, in the 1930s is on the par of today. Although there was a lot of it 
back in the 1920s, and there's a lot of it today. So, but I'm not sure. But I, I think your point about how this constant uh, sort of rotation um, in, the, in the younger ages is very pertinent because it does keep the age composition of the immigrant population relatively young and of people who've had either short or sporadic uh, visits, to the, visits to the United States. And so they haven't had much time to sort of accumulate a lot of exposure. Now your issue about selection, whether or not immigration of, whether immigrants who choose, who know that they're going to come here and spend five years and then make a bunch of money and then go home, whether they bother to invest in English. This is a, a working hypothesis. I think it's probably true. Learning language is hard, particularly when you're out in the fields. I mean, you have to make special effort, I mean, intensive efforts to do that. So there's that. Um, and then there's the issue of, well, somebody comes here, they intend to stay for as long as they're happy and earning money or whatever, and then it turns out that they struggle with learning a second language. So they may be, they may be more likely to leave uh, than the ones who come here and find to their delight that English is easy for them. So there's all sorts of issues involved with this emigration and selection and changing of the age composition. I don't think it's been looked at very well, in large part because it's so hard to find data on immigrants, and let alone their language skills. One thing that linguists like to point out uh, in the comparison, to make the comparison fair between the turn of the century and a more recent immigration from Asia, is that you are dealing with different language families. Even though you know you have a huge variety of language coming, languages coming from Europe, but they're still in the European kind of similar inflectional systems and um, alphabetical languages. Go to Asia, where you have a variety of writing systems, a variety of agglutinating versus polysynthetic yes, versus yes. other typologically different languages that may even make it a, a, a more of a you know a distance that the immigrant has to cover to get to mm -hmm. English successfully. It's one hypothesis that you know of, um, I, motivation is key absolutely but there may be this structural distance that is objectively there too. Well the linguists are not very happy um, because the sociology literature has shown that uh, linguistic distance or, or uh, linguistic origins play much less of a role than they think they should. And there are, <laughs> yeah. there are small significant differences, but very small dis, um, differences in yeah. how quickly it is. For example, kids from very Asian kids versus Spanish kids versus uh, Finnish kids, for example, from some of the really strange language families in, in Europe uh, exactly. learn there English. So, but probably the biggest predictor is whether or not the kid or the adult is educated or comes from an educated family and whether or not they're literate because literacy is really the push, the, the prime factor uh, that differentiates these populations and this is why the Spanish speakers are so disadvantaged because they're coming without strong, the adults are coming without strong literacy skills. Versus Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, almost too good. Uh, it turns out that things I would like to understand better are very complicated in a way, and there's a lot of different factors to consider. So, thank you very much.